The company screws up through, as corporations often do, through greed. And we've seen in our own days many examples of corporations which seem impregnably strong, impregnably um, uh, dominant in, economically, and, and, and whose share price seems Im Im immovable, suddenly collapse uh, when circumstances change, new, a new balance sheet comes in, and suddenly the share price sinks and the company goes under. And this happens to the company in 1770. 1764, it's finally conquered all of North India with the Battle of Buxar. And it takes them only six years to asset strip, loot, and plunder Bengal so thoroughly that when the famine of 1770 comes, there is no surpluses. There are no granaries stocked with grain. Uh, the company is not in the business of setting up soup kitchens or it's a company. It's there, you know, unequivocally to make a profit in the same way that you know, Goldman Sachs is there to make a profit today. Goldman Sachs doesn't pretend that it's there about, it exists uh, you know, for famously for its corporate social responsibility. It's there you know, to make more money for its, for its shareholders and its partners than any other business in the world. And the company works on that principle. So when the famine comes, the Nawab of Avad at the same time employs, you know, builds an Imam Bara, employs 100,000 people, paying them all a rupee a day, and they live. Um, they build this thing, they get, they get money to buy food, and they live. In Calcutta and in Bengal, instead, one million Bengalis die. Uh, a fifth of the population of Bengal. And when, in the first year, the company, by sending sepoys out into the villages and gathering tax revenue by force at the point of a bayonet and hanging anybody who doesn't pay, manages to maintain revenues at pre-famine levels, the shareholders in London vote themselves an increased dividend from 10% to 12.5%. And this happens for two years. Then finally, in the third year, there's no, there's no slack. There's, no, there's nothing left. They've, they've, as one Scots writer and whistleblower writes, they have, they have picked the Bengal bones to the, uh, the, to the marrow or some, some phrase like that. Uh, and it lies bleaching in the wind. Um, and so the share price sinks. 30 banks collapse across Europe. It's like the subprime, but only worse. Um, and this is the moment that for the first time in its history, the government begins to take an interest in the East India Company. Up to now, they've been a valuable source of customs revenue. And no one has asked too many questions about where this money is coming from. It provides a third of British customs. Uh, and it pays its taxes, and the, and the government's fine with it. Suddenly, whistleblowers are writing reports of a million bodies in the streets of Calcutta. The Ganges clogged with corpses, vultures and dogs picking at human remains. Clouds of s flies and vultures like some biblical plague. And suddenly everyone in Britain wakes up to the fact that all this stuff is going on. And there is outrage. I mean, quite impressively angry editorials and newspapers. There is a play in the Haymarket where Clive is satirized as Lord Vulture. Um, and more specifically, Parliament has to bail out the company because it is literally too big to fail. So the company in 1774, through its own greed, puts itself in a position where it becomes now part, uh, partly a government. Um, it's bailed out by the government, so the government now has a regulating role over it. And from that point onwards, it changes from this buccaneer libertarian organization, unregulated, unwatched over, just a source of money, to what I suppose we would today would call a public-private partnership, until eventually in 1857, when it screws up a second time during the Great Indian Uprising, and 300,000 are killed in the reprisals, and India is nearly lost um, to, to, to Great Britain, the, the government rolls up the company completely, and in our terms is nationalized. 